So this morning I will continue this teaching. Um, well, next Sunday is practical reflection. I hope I'm right. It's practical reflection. So let me do justice to what I have here. I have four, five different areas I want to share with us about honoring. Five different areas. Um, I want to start by saying that honor is part of what is called the Abrahamic covenant of God. The covenant God gave Abraham, which is also for us, but basically for the Jews, part of that covenant is honor. And if honor is part of his covenant, you don't have to belabor yourself to attract honor to yourself or you are seeking for honor. It is part of his covenant. I want to believe those of you who know the Bible, you will understand what I'm saying. If you don't understand all I'm saying, take in the much you can. So in Genesis chapter 3, media, Genesis, excuse me, Genesis chapter 12, 1 to 3, Genesis 12, 1 to 3, um, I will appreciate it if media can move a bit faster. Genesis chapter 12, 1 to 3. It starts by saying, Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Verse 2. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I would ask the first blessing there. I would make of thee a great nation. Number two, I will bless thee. Number three, I will make your name great. That's part of honor. I will make your name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. So the, the three blessings mentioned there is for the purpose of you releasing the same blessing to others, being a blessing. Verse 3. And I will bless thee, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So this morning, I'll just touch on the benefits of honor. I will try to describe what honor is as I did two Sundays ago. I will touch a bit on it and then I will go on the benefits of honor. And uh, remember that honor is the culture, is the culture of heaven, is the way things are done in the presence of the Lord. We are not in heaven now. I mean, we are not in the third heaven now. We are here, and right here, we are in his presence. In your house, if you cultivate the presence of the Lord, he's there with you. So we cultivate the culture of honor. The culture of honor. And uh, I gave us the description that honor is high respect, high respect, great esteem. Honor is the quality of knowing and doing what is morally right. Example, I must, as a matter of honor, avoid any taint of this honor. If honor is the culture of heaven, we better begin to learn how to honor people right from the earth before we get there. Now for this morning, I start 
The Genesis 12 that I've read is to give us the understanding that it is part of God's covenant to honor people who honor him, people who serve him. And people who serve him are not churchgoers. They are people who serve him from their heart. There are things you will not do because you know it's dishonoring to God. There are things you will not say to somebody or act out before somebody because you know when you dishonor that person, whether young or old, when you dishonor that person, you are dishonoring God. Okay? So it is his covenant to honor his own. Now, the five aspects I want to give us is one, honoring, no, honor for parents. The fifth psalm in the, excuse me, the fifth commandment in the Ten Commandments says honor. Do you know it? Do you know it? Can you shout it loud out? Wow. Wonderful. I'm glad you know it. Honor your father and mother so your days will be long on earth. I learned from Dr. Mike Murdoch. That was the first time in my life I was hearing anybody say that. He said, honor is the beginning, is the secret, is the foundation of your prosperity. Honor. You don't hear it everywhere. It's not hustling. It's not putting down somebody so you can come up. But honor of your parents okay let, let me balance it honor of your parents and for those of us who are born again that scripture does not say honor your parents when they are born again honor your parents when they are good and kind to you it just says honor your father and your mother I can imagine all the questions in your mind. Suppose my dad was an absentee father, never cared for us, was never providing. So how do God expect me to honor him? It will take me a lot to paint a picture, hoping you understand it. There is an order that is God's order, O-R-D-R, D-E-R, order. Something is put in order, in place, in right, in its proper order. The order of God on earth, for you to be able, whether you are doing spiritual warfare, all these, uh, the witches and wizards are chasing me. If you understand God's order, and intentionally put yourself in God's order, you'll be protected. I don't know how simply I can explain that. But you need to understand that God has his order. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul talks, even though he was talking about marriage there, um, but he said, God is the head of Christ and Christ is the head of the man and the man is the head of the woman. Now when you look at the culture and see how that order has been distorted, you'll be tempted to discard it. Especially for me, a female, that woman is made to be Satan. And the culture trumps it and trumps it. I learned from the Bible this order of God. And uh, I do my best to stay under that order. 
to stay under that order. When God created man, and that man is male, female. When he created man, the female was within him. But it was the male that he put in charge of managing his creation. It was the male. And then when he put him, he gave him all the instructions what to do with the creation. He gave him the wisdom how to manage the creation. And when it got to the point of help for him, out of him, out of the male, he brought forth the woman. He has his order. When he said to us, honor your father and your mother, please listen carefully. Your parents might have been very cruel to you. As a leader, all my life, I've heard about father wound. Father wound. I've heard it over the decades. Children that have grown and their father did terrible things to them. And it's always difficult to forgive such. Very difficult. And that's where you need to say, Lord, give me the heart. Give me the heart to forgive. Give me the heart not to despise. Can somebody say despise? Let me hear you. Despise. Let me hear you clearly. You, you, you guard your spirit not to despise your parents. Don't despise them. It's God's order for your life. You, when you fall out of order, you're on your own. No protection. There's so much one can say here, but I have to go on. So, learn. Let me share with you what I did. Like you, some of you have heard me say before, my two parents died before I turned 10 years of age. So, I didn't have much of relationship or recollections of things. But when I began to pay attention to the scriptures, as I was reading it every day, I realized that the order of God requires that every one of us, male or female, should be under authority. Male or female, we should be under authority. So my parents were late. And uh, I wouldn't tell you that it was very long ago I came to this understanding. It's in this my adulthood that I, I reflected on what I was reading from the Bible and realized that I need to honor my elder brother. When I was younger, it was cat and rat. Not because of him, but because of me. You have an elder brother you want to bluff, uh, you want to throw yourself and all of that. It was cat and rat. But in my adulthood, the Holy Spirit began to say to me, it is time to stop finding fault. It is time to honor. And I listened inward as how am I to honor this man, we call him daddy. He's 82 plus. So we, his siblings, he's the only male we have amongst the eight of us. So we call him daddy. And the Holy Spirit used that to work on my heart. That it is time to start honoring him. And then I had learned by then... From Dr. Mike Murdoch, that honor is what you do. 
It's not what you say. It's what you do. It's a high respect. It's how you conduct yourself, how you, how you carry yourself. And I dare say that if you don't have honor in you, you can't give it to anybody. If you don't know how to honor, it, you can't give anybody honor. But I want to encourage you. It's a powerful spiritual key. Powerful spiritual key for a child of God. Honor. So there were ways that the Holy Spirit impressed on my heart to honor my brother. And I will reach out to him. My late sister, the one I said was closer to me, I honored her. Because as a teenage girl, she was there for me. When nobody was there, she was there. She had nothing to give me, nothing. Absolutely nothing. But she prayed for me. Always there. Young people, you never know the tears of your parents before God. You better honor them. Honor those tears. Honor those prayers. Without them, I assure you, you can't be where you are today. I don't know a parent that have a child and is saying, God, kill this child. Don't let this child become anything good. Finish him. Don't let him. No, no parent does that. So learn to honor. Learn to honor. So let me go to, I'm just doing all of this to help you grasp something, the benefits of honor. So that honor your parents is in Exodus 20, verse 12. You can read the rest of the Ten Commandments there. Then number two, I want to talk of honor from the Jewish tradition. The Jewish tradition. What constitutes honor in the Jewish tradition? Number one, it says, let, let, let me give it to you the way I found the definition. It says, um, the person who is honorable <laughs> is someone who must provide for others with food and drink and clothing. So if you are to honor your family, your nuclear family, you are, you are to be a provider of food, drink, clothing, what will I say about shelter? You provide a place that your family will live. That makes you an honorable person. Please forget this new culture that has turned the word of God upside down. So is the female now we are looking towards to provide. She has to uh, be the one paying house rent. She has to be the one. Hello? Do you know there's a culture in this nation where the men don't walk? How many of you know that? Yes. There's a culture in Nigeria where the men don't believe in walk. They don't walk. Their mind is they marry the woman. The woman is to provide everything. Everything. So they are there to eat and enjoy. And that is the prevailing thing running through the world today. The person who is supposed to provide food, drink, and clothing, and shelter, and let's not talk about the psychological side, because that one is completely lacking in our culture. There's no connectivity with members of your family. You don't know how to treat your wife. You don't know how to relate with your children. You are so distant. 
So an honorable person is really a provider. And you bring home, I'm still talking about the Jewish tradition, you bring uh, one that should bring the people in your home, uh, you bring them home, take them out, provide them with all their needs, and I like this, cheerfully. <laughs> I was somewhere with Pastor Kenny, I think it was week before last, and both of us saw this young couple with three beautiful children. Well, as mothers that we are, our eyes, without thinking twice, went to the children. We were already smiling, and the children were looking at us. And I was particularly so distracted by those kids and watching how they were clinging to their father. The last one just clung to the father. And at a point, the three of them were clinging to their father. It is a God thing. It is a God thing. Without a father in the home, there's no backbone. Now, young people, you wouldn't know this. I didn't know it when I was your age. But growing older, I realized that all of life physically is behind our back. So when your back has problem, every other, the rest of the frame of your body has problem. That's why you see people growing older and they, they are bent. Your back. So when the father is absent or the father is not honorable, There's no backbone there. So you bring them home, you take them out, provide them with all their needs cheerfully. I go from the Jewish tradition to how you treat an elder. I've talked about parents, how you treat an elder. Media, can you give me 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1? First Timothy, please quickly. First Timothy 5 1. That scripture says, Rebuke not an elder. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. And the younger men as brethren the older women as mothers the younger as sisters with all purity it's talking about the female in that verse with all purity rebuke not an elder in the course of the work of ministry, I've heard young men, when they are really mad at their moms, so they come to me and say, I, I want to rebuke my mother. Ah, my head goes, Wham! this one doesn't know. He will be in trouble with God, not even with the mother, but with God. And I say to them, we don't rebuke parents father and mother. We don't rebuke them. The word there is entreat them. Is there an English person that wants to help me with that? Entreat. How do you entreat? Entreat an elder. Appeal. You cannot show honor sitting on mountain top with pride and ego. You can't. After all, I'm somebody. Nobody should talk to me anyhow. I know what I'm doing. I heard this a lot <laughs> many years back. I know what I'm doing. And the person is messing up and telling you I know what I'm doing. 
appeal to them. Appeal to them. Can I share with you how it worked for me? I've served, I've served people you will call global figures. God gave me opportunity to serve them because he gave me a servant heart. I love to serve. I love to serve. He makes my world. And I had been under these people and they said things against me that I had no idea about. I never thought of such, never did any such thing, but they attribute things to me. You must have this, you must have the other one. Naturally, I get angry. I want to snap back and say, why do you talk to me that way? After all, I'm the general overseer of Logos and Flame Ministries. But you know, if you, if you have allowed the word of God to work on you, the voice of the Holy Spirit will pop up quickly. And I'm always saying, Holy Spirit, please tell me what to say. Please, what do I say in this situation? How do I handle this? And he gives me a knowing how to put that situation, turn it around. So instead of us fighting and exchanging words, I find myself saying something that kind of jolts that person. I don't introduce myself. I don't say, do you know who I am? Me, I would die a million death. Because whoever I think I am, Paul says in Corinthians, that what do you have that was not given to you? What is it about you that God did not give you that you want to be proud about? I still have a big one coming. Did you get something there? He said, talk to elders, appeal to them. If you can't get a word to respond immediately, create time. If you are like me, I love writing. So I will process what I want to say. I will pray about it. I will listen in what to the Holy Spirit. And then I will write and give it to the person. It has saved me a lot. A lot than exchanging words, throwing words at people. Rebuke not an elder. Number four, I quickly want to talk about Aaron and Miriam. Excuse me, so sorry, I didn't get the scriptures, I didn't put it there. But the elder brother and elder sister of Moses in the Bible, Aaron and Miriam. They were leaders alongside Moses, but it was Moses that God called. And um, <laughs> the Bible said one day they were mad at Moses, younger brother. And they were talking about his black-skinned wife, a cushion. He thinks he's the only one that hears God. He comes down to tell us, the Lord said this, the Lord said that. We too, we hear the Lord. We are also prophets. He speaks to us. He can't be showing up that way and he married this Christian woman. By the way, that was different from the Median woman that had the two sons for him. That aside, it's good to read the Bible and study it. So while they dishonored him in their conversation, in their privacy, God took offense. Remember I started? God's order. It is his order. When you dishonor people, God is the one that fights for them. 
I've been dishonored in this work of ministry. <laughs> I've been dishonored and dishonored and dishonored. And they do their dishonor in the house of God to me. Only one woman dared came to my house to dishonor me and disrespect me. I still remember I, I was dumbfounded. I couldn't say a word. I'm not one of those preachers who want to tell you they dishonored me and as they were going home, they have car accident. God forbid. Uh, uh, the same Bible said, if you rejoice over the trouble of your enemy. How many of you have seen that in your Bible? If you rejoice over the trouble of your enemy, God won't deal with him again. Okay? So, um, God is the one that fights for his own. God is the one that fights for his own. He taught me through the scriptures. Don't think evil against people. Don't speak evil against people. Don't curse. Some of our culture in Nigeria, every word is a curse. God punish you. Your head is not good. You are stupid idiots. Everything we want to say, we are cursing. You don't do that if you are an honorable person. You don't curse people. When you think evil of people and wish them evil, the Bible calls it malice. You wish them evil. Am I helping you to learn how to be honorable? Yes. You better answer me. Yes. Oh, I hold back the last one I have. I've given you four already. Number five. It's in the book of Jude. For some strange reason, this morning, the book of Jude won't open to me. <laughs> I tried it in Google, it won't open. I tried it in my Bible app, it won't open. I said, what is the problem? It has only one chapter. And that chapter is loaded. You know, what our people call spiritual warfare? How many of you have been involved in spiritual warfare? I'm asking you a question. Raise your hand. You've been involved in spiritual warfare. I bind you. Um, you know, sometimes it's funny to me. I bind you. I release you. I cast you. We say all manner of things to these spirits that know more than us. Media gave me the book of Jude. And if you can, give me the message translation. That's the first time I will use message translation. I rarely go there. The book of Jude. Let me quickly tell you what is there before it comes on on the screen. Um, Jude was one of Jesus' biological half brother he wrote that book and he focused on spiritual hierarchy. I had done spiritual warfare years and years. Thank God for reading my Bible every day. And one particular year, the Holy Spirit highlighted the importance of the book of Jude. Media, what's happening? I don't have all the time. Is that the message? Okay, everybody can see it. So let's read it. I, Jude, am a slave of Jesus Christ and brother 
to James. <laughs> Can anybody see honor in that? I told you he's about the, one of the biological brothers of Jesus. But look at the way he introduced himself. He couldn't bring himself to say, I'm the brother of Jesus. Jude, I'm a slave to Jesus Christ and brother to James. James is also Jesus' biological half-brother. Writing to those loved by God the Father, called and kept safe by Jesus Christ. Verse 2. I'm going through the whole book, so please, whoever is giving me this, be alert. Relax. Everything's going to be all right. Rest. Everything's coming together. Open your hearts. Love is on the way. Dear friends, I've dropped everything to write to you about this life of salvation that we have in common. I have to write insisting, begging, that you fight with everything you have in you for this faith entrusted to us as a gift to God and cherish. In King James it says contend, the same thing, fight. Your, your salvation, your being born again, fight. Contend for it. The devil wants to take it off you. Fight for it. Verse 4. What has happened is that some people, now you will see the Nigerian Pentecostal church of today in what we are reading. What has happened is that some people have infiltrated our ranks. Our scriptures warned us this would happen. Who benefits, who, who benefits their pious skin are shameless scoundrels. Their design is to replace the sheer grace of God with sheer license which means doing away with Jesus Christ, our one and only Savior. I'm trying to get used to this translation. <laughs> okay, verse 5. We are almost there. I'm laying this out as clearly as I can. Even though you once knew all, you once knew all this well enough and shouldn't need reminding. Here it is in brief. The master saved a people out of the land of Egypt. Later he destroyed those who defected. Six. And you know the story of the angels. Now pay attention from this verse. You know the story of the angels who didn't stick to their post, abandoning it for other, for other darker missions. But they are now chained and jailed in a black hole until the great judgment day. Seven. Sodom and Gomorrah, which went to sexual rock and ruin along with the surrounding cities that acted just like them are another example burning and burning and never burning up. They serve still as a stock warning. This is exactly the same program of these latest infiltrators. Dirty sex, rule and rulers thrown out. Did anybody get that? 
This is exactly the same program of these latest infiltrators. Dirty sex, rule, that is order, keeping order. And the rulers and the people that keep the order are thrown out. Glory dragged in the mud. Okay, you know something? Give me King James. Uh, okay, let me read verse 9 and see how it goes. The archangel Michael, who went to the mart with the devil <laughs> as they fought over the body of Moses, wouldn't have dared level. This is, this, this is the verse I'm heading to. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him, that is, does not bring against the devil, a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now you can read the rest. When the Holy Spirit, the year he highlighted this to me, it was humbling. I bowed and I said, Lord, forgive me. I would have died. I've had questions about people who claim to be deliverance ministers. They do all manner of things in the name of deliverance. And they pray and somebody dies. I'm sure you know those things. They pray somebody dies. <laughs> fire, fire, burn them. Um, whatever. This scripture is telling us that even fallen angels, they fell because of what they did, but their position before God, we're not taking off them. The power they had was not taken off them. And look at you and I, little human beings, we rail against them. The devil is stupid. <laughs> the devil is a bastard. Maybe you are one of the people that have said things like that. You forget it's because of Jesus that you are spared. But for Jesus, the devil just needs to look at you and you are twisted. That verse 8 says, when angel Michael, who was the archangel in, in heaven, the angel of war, he's also called the angel of the nation of Israel. He was asked to go bury the body of Moses. If you know your Bible, I don't have to tell you all the details. He was assigned to bury the body of Moses. Nobody knew where Moses was buried up till today. But Archangel Michael was asked to bury him. And when he went to bury the body of Moses, the devil showed up. The devil himself also an archangel but fallen. You are wondering where we are. We are still in Lekki, in Lagos State. <laughs> And I'm still teaching the Bible. So the devil showed up and contended for the body of Moses. I can imagine the, this kind of argument. Moses was rejected because he was angry. His anger that made him not to enter the land. Why would God honor him? And the Bible said there, put that verse up again, that Michael, by implication, Michael respected the position that Lucifer had before he fell. He did not bring, it says, um, 
Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a railing accusation. He looks at the position that Lucifer occupied. And he said to him, the Lord rebuke you. He didn't begin to say, you, you devil, you disrespected God, and he chased you down, and here you are suffering, and you have the mouth to come here and challenge me. It's God who gave me this work to do. No, he didn't. The day I got this revelation from this scripture, it changed my approach to deliverance, whatever. People that knew me 38 years ago, I always say I'm not a deliverance minister. I'm not a ladura. So let me run it up for you. Honor. Honor. If you don't have honor in you, you can't give it. If you don't know the word of God, you don't, you don't really, because honor comes with value. The value you've gotten from the scriptures. When that first Timothy 5 says, deal with the young women as your sisters. In other words, he's saying, you see the young sister looking so beautiful and you lost after her because of the value you have in your mind you will not touch her you give her honor and respect and treat her with dignity everything we need is in the Bible the wisdom we need the knowledge the understanding it's in the Bible. If you hear me until the last breath of my life, I will still say it, read your Bible. There's so much wisdom there. It will save you from a lot. It will make you, 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 you know my attitude? I learned this from the late Archbishop Idahosa, their ministry. And pastors were busy running them down. How many pastors would have the chiefs of Bini land sit in front? They give them a section. They come with their regalia. While the modern day preacher will be saying, oh, these are wizards. They shouldn't come in. People were saying it that time. They shouldn't come into the house of God. They are devilish people. How will they hear the gospel? Are they doomed forever? How will they hear the gospel? If the light in you is not greater than the darkness in the traditional ruler, then you don't know Jesus. After he had gone to be with the Lord, I was in one of their services in Benin, and um, the wife was coming in, and she came in from the back door, and she was with her hands this way, and she would bow as she's going to the altar. She would do that for very spiritual people. She's not powerful. She's not spiritual. I always say the Nigerian church, they know everything about witches and wizards. They know the day they meet. They know the hour they meet. They know when they fly. They know, that's the Pentecostal church. They know so much but they don't know anything about the Holy Spirit. They don't know the Holy Spirit. And that's the power that will defeat, I mean, that has already defeated the works of darkness. Don't you think you have a long way to go? Talk to me. Talk to me. The same Bible you read, my own is not written in golden letter. It's the same. 
is there. God is in that book. And the final thing I will say, God said in the book of 1 Samuel, maybe chapter 30, I always mix the chapters up. He was talking about the house of Eli. And he said, I will honor those who honor me. If you honor him, he will honor you. If you avoid certain things because of him, he will never forget it. He will honor you. The seeds you sow, good seeds you sow in the lives of people, those people cannot pay you back. They cannot honor you. But God sees those seeds. He will never forget. You are as quiet as though uh, you have never practiced it. Talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. How many of you love the Lord? I really hope you do love him. Your life will not remain the same. Any pathway, they say, people can pass through, you can pass through. Because the host of heaven are behind you. You know him in such a personal way. You love him that you want to honor him. You want to honor him. And because you want to honor him, he will honor you. It is not easy to forgive people in the flesh. But with his strength in you, you can forgive any pain. You can forgive any hurt. You can forgive. Amen. 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 Did I help you today? Give it to him. His word is alive. His word is powerful. His word has a transforming power. 